Fire Emblem is whack. Fire Emblem Three Houses is ultimate. You ever just play a video game and connect with it a little too well? Like, you can't imagine a world without that particular video game in it? Well, that's Fire Emblem Three Houses for me. I mean, how could I even set foot outside knowing Leone doesn't exist? Shut up! If you've never played Fire Emblem Three Houses before, I highly recommend. It's probably my favorite game on Nintendo Switch, simply because it fulfills a lifelong dream of mine. You see, I always wanted a game where you could create your own villains, essentially meaning that your choices lead you to fighting different people. These people would be fleshed out, and heck, if you chose differently, you could even be fighting alongside them in some cases. A format like this worked very hand-in-hand -hand with the Fire Emblem formula. Introduce a great ensemble and have you befriend them, kill them, or have them befriend or kill each other. It's pretty intense when you get to the nitty gritty of it, especially when you like these characters. And Fire Emblem Three Houses has a lot of characters to like, particularly the students you have to teach, cause you're a professor and all that. A very unprofessional professor. So today I would like to take a journey through Garrick Mach Monastery and figure out exactly who are the best students objectively. <laughs> I kid of course, these are my opinions. Opinions mixed with facts, I guess. Look, all I'm saying is that I love Balthus, but I could never put him on a list with the best students in the game. He's essentially the Fire Emblem version of Bradicus. I don't even know who we're fighting. I would rank the staff too, but the students are just better written on average. Though honestly, there isn't a bad character in this game besides Surreal, so don't take this as a sign that I'm forgetting anyone. I took literally every student into consideration and ranked them accordingly in a convenient list of 13. 13. Yes, 13. This is a top 13 list. The reason for that is because the main lords are included. How could they not be? The entire narrative revolves around them, so they have to be interesting. As such, I wanted to have 10 other slots open for the rest of the students. The ones that don't get routes dedicated to them. Even though I would totally follow Ferdinand von Eyre into the jaws of death if he became emperor. I am Ferdinand von Eyre. So sit back and enjoy this top 13 list. Also, spoil for like every route. This video is essentially Ferdinand von Spoiler. No wait! <laughs> In a narrative where characters are morally ambiguous and no one is truly 100% evil, we have the very incarnate of evil. Hubert von Vestra is the closest this game gets to a playable unit that is straight up a menace. Whenever he is intending to Lady Edelgard, he is most likely killing someone on behalf of Lady Edelgard. Or stalking Bernadetta. One of those things. The reason why I like Hubert so much is because of how unapologetic his character is. You'd think he'd be misunderstood, but no. Not really. He's exactly who he presents himself as. Now, there is more to him than meets the eye, for sure, but Hubert doesn't ever really change or warm up. He only has one purpose in his life, and that is to devote himself entirely to the small emperor of the Adrestian Empire. Whether he is threatening your life or being defeated, but he can't fall here. He must make his retreat for the billionth time. Just know you have quite the creepy friend watching your back or a stubborn antagonist that will put a knife in it because he is Edelgard's grand retainer and nothing will ever change that. Think to do, but actually interesting. I mean, heck, dude even comes with his own theme song. A theme song he shares with no one else in the entire game. Hard wink. <laughs> When people ask why I like Three Houses so much, it's because it features characters like Ingrid Galatea. Not just one-note stereotypes, characters that actually feel like people. And being really pretty also helps a bit. With blonde hair brighter than my future, Ingrid comes flying in on her Pegasus to say, hey, you're gonna wanna listen to all my supports. And listen we shall, because we have a duty to be better than those airheads that just call her a racist. Where do I even start with Ingrid? Well, first off, she has crippling survivor's guilt because her fiance Glenn died in the tragedy of Dusker, and he died like a true knight. Thank you, Rodrigue. And the tragedy of Dusker is one of the most important events in the entire game, having long-term effects on everyone involved. So there's that going on with Ingrid. But oh wait, she also doesn't seem to like to do because he is a man from Dusker. Geez, Ingrid, I don't like to do either, but you can't just be like that because he's from Dusker. So not only is she facing her own guilt, but she also is taking it out on someone that wasn't even involved. Don't worry, she learns her lesson not to be racist, don't worry. I feel like I need to tread this carefully or else 
I'll be having my own tragedy of Dusker. So she has a lot on her plate already. But let's add on more to her plate. Literally, because she is a glutton. Seriously, talk about one character in the game that I wasn't expecting to be in love with food. Especially because we already have a character like that already. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. So she has a bit of PTSD, is problematic, and loves food. Oh, but did I also mention that she comes from a poor family? Yep, despite being a noble, her family is in dire need of money. They are broke. And as a result, she is pressured into eventually getting getting married for the sake of her family's livelihood. Girl's not even used to wearing makeup. It's okay, Ingrid, neither am I. So that's a lot to keep track of, right? I can't imagine there's anything else. Someday, I'll be a knight. What? You want to be a knight now? Are you sure you're not supposed to be the protagonist of the game? She's openly prejudiced. She can't be. Fair point. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, when I was playing through the game for the first time, blue lines represent, I was very confused to see memes of a small white-haired child one-shotting the Death Knight. And then Crispy himself confirmed to me that, yes indeed, Lysithia von Ordelia is one of the most powerful units in the game. And I was just like, huh? The sassy girl that likes candy? That's the one we fear? Oh yes, she is the one we fear. But Lysithia deep down is just a sweetheart with a sweet tooth. One who wants to live her days to the fullest before... Well, she's not gonna live long. The reason her hair is white is because of the horrific experiments afflicted upon her, which resulted in her ability to wield two crests, something that may or may not repeat itself with another character. Once I learned that, I completely understood Lysithia, and I sympathized with her, which I feel like a lot of people did too. Like, every time I play this game, I have to recruit every student that's just law, but Lysithia is put on the ASAP list alongside Marianne. She doesn't want to be treated like a kid, and with the added context that she might not have that much time as an adult, it hits me in the feels, not gonna lie. Though other than her backstory, she's not really the woe is me type. There's a lot of hilarious moments with Lysithia. For example, the fact that she thinks that Kate can blackmail Felix into being silent is rich, especially because Felix doesn't like anything. Kate could blackmail me, though. I love cake, especially old gateaus. Mmm, old gateaus. Here we go! Caspar von Burglies. Actually, that's a lot easier to pronounce than it looks. You know what I love about Caspar? He only has one love punching. But he's not a jerk about it. He reminds me of Aaron Yeager, but like, young Aaron, before he saw the ocean. Caspar is quite the friendly. Boy. With a great design, no less. I don't see baby blue hair a lot in anime, but he rocks it. Especially that time skip appearance, lord have mercy. The reason why Caspar caught my attention, though, is because he had a random support with Ash. Like, out of nowhere. Seriously, they don't share a house or backstory, they just sort of bumped into each other. What's interesting about Caspar is that he's one of the game's many nobles, and he sort of has this weird thing where he doesn't want to be a noble. Okay, it's not that weird. Practically every noble in this game is like, I'm not one of those basic nobles, I'm different. I don't know if I like it though, because the game hammers home that nobles have a rift with commoners and think they're superior. But there's like only two characters that actually think like that. Though perhaps the writing is also saying that deep down, there is no difference between noble and commoner. I think I pretty much just went in a circle with that rant. Where was I? Ah yes, Caspar does not want to be a noble. He feels a sense of guilt for what his father did to Petra's in the war between Dagda and Brigid. This, on top of seeing that the noble life is incredibly restrictive, leads him to not wanting any of that. Fortunately for him, he was born without a crest, and as a result, his family couldn't care less about him. What a lucky break, am I right? Although apparently this is how he developed his competitive nature. He always seeks to prove himself. Jesus Please, Casper, just be happy with never living up to your family's unreasonable expectations like the rest of us. The biggest accomplishment that Caspar achieved, though, and drumroll please... Aww, I thought I had bongos. He managed to have a good support with Linhart. Their friendship is awesome and I love it. And that's a surprise because I really don't like Linhart. But it feels like Caspar and Linhart bring out the best in each other. He even makes Linhart care. On top of that, this support even managed to squeeze out my favorite line in the game. You know, I'm going to agree with you just so I don't have to keep talking. Is that all? 
when you're so edgy that you have to be a swordsman. For number 9, we have Sasuke Uchiha, I mean Felix Hugo Vardarius, the last surviving son of House Vardarius after his brother Glenn died like a true knight. <sighs> Do we need to have a talk, Rodrigue? You can find Felix in the training grounds training, and if he's not doing that, he's training somewhere else. Now, usually I would call this being one note, but Felix's obsession with being a swordsman is actually tied to his character. It's acknowledged that he's too obsessive. You get plenty of reasons why he can't just stop training though, and talking to him for about two seconds reveals that he is quite hostile to pretty much everyone he comes into contact with. So why do I like him? First off, he's the only character in the entire game that saw Dimitri's dark side coming. Felix is pretty much shouting at you to watch out for Dimitri whenever he sees you talking to him, and you're just sitting there wondering, why not? Dimitri's nice. And he's like, nah bro, you weren't there when he went crazy. Keep in mind, this is coming from one of the biggest jerks in the game. A guy who practices his craft of fighting with blades every day. Spectacular work, Felix! Why are you here? You're interrupting. So when he is telling you that Dimitri is going too far, you know something is up. Either way, Felix is a delight in his supports. Usually it involves someone being nice to him, Felix then being like, get away from me, ugh, which leads to them trying to melt Felix's icy heart. And then there's the support with Bernadetta where he scared her, it happens a lot, and she ran away from him. But the way she ran away from him was with such speed and technique that he has to track her down to find out how she did it. It's it's so great. On top of that, Felix also has the most people he can romance. He is literally tied with Byleth for the most possible endings in the entire game. Though to be fair, I can get why. Hey, all I'm saying is that Felix is one handsome dude. He can definitely get those multiple endings with multiple different people. But in my opinion, he and Annette are just made for each other. Don't at me. <laughs> Sylvain's here because I like that gif of him dancing alone in the ballroom. Only reason, moving on. No, 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 keep going. Ugh, fine. Okay, what do I like about Sylvain? Well, first of all, Sylvain is a womanizer, but there's depth there, since he doesn't actually respect girls because he thinks they only like him for his crest. So it creates an interesting dynamic that the skirt chaser is actually a massive incel. Wow, I am really gonna have to explain more before my subscribers start dropping. Let's see, um... Hey, did you know his brother tried to kill him? Yup, his brother was born without a crest, and Sylvain was. And crests are the end-all be-all in Fodlin. So Miklon grew jealous of Sylvain for having one, and one thing led to another. As a result, Sylvain despises crests, which happens quite a lot in Three Houses. Throughout his life, girls have only approached him for what he can do for their bloodline. They only want him for his crest. That's it. So he takes what he wants, gives no respect, and leaves them high and dry. It is a very toxic mindset. But after seeing his supports, it becomes clear that he just needs to find decent companionship. He hides a lot of himself, and once you bring it out, you find an intelligent, loyal, and committed individual. It's kind of a beautiful narrative in Sylvain's development. Having his issues with thinking of people wrong, even if he doesn't actually treat them wrong, but learning slowly to respect those same people. As you can see, this happens a lot in three houses as well. Stigmas are formed because people have limited exposure. That is how people grow ignorant, and that's why it's so important to communicate and learn as much as you can. I think everyone can learn from that. Also, Sylvain is part of the Blue Lion's Holy Trinity, so he has that going for him. <laughs> She's depressed, she prefers not to talk to you, and she has the oldest Xbox known to Fodlin. Who else could it be but Marianne Von Edmund, a character that can blend into the background if players aren't careful. Yeah, that uh, that shamelessly happened to me. I forgot to recruit her into my house before part two, and then I forgot about her existence altogether, and then I learned why she's not in part two, so I make it a point to recruit her every time now. But Marianne has more going on than just being incredibly depressed. She and Bernadetta form what I like to call the two sides of social anxiety. Yeah, Marianne has social anxiety, so, uh, hashtag relatable, am I right, guys? Come on, guys, am I right? Come on. Her social anxiety leads her to keeping to herself, and when you talk to her, she doesn't have a lot to say. She's not prepared for anyone to talk to her. And why would she be? She doesn't give people a reason to socialize with her. But with most people who are introverted, she was adopted by a loud extrovert. Hilda and Marianne are probably my favorite besties in the game. They're perfect friends. 
Friends, yes, I said it, fight me. And just like with Caspar and Linhart, they really bring out the best in each other. Marianne teaches Hilda what she doesn't know, and vice versa. Hilda needs an outlet too, and Marianne serves her role as an outlet very well. It also reveals that Hilda is much more competent than she lets on. She's lazy, yeah, but she's not a moron. Marianne also needs help, and Hilda supplies it. Oh yeah, and uh, if you're especially cruel and put Marianne and Hilda on opposite sides during the war, Marianne will express she's sorry things ended this way, and then Hilda goes out of her way to reassure Marianne that she doesn't blame her? Ugh, it's just, ugh, it's so good, yet so bad. I can never do it, but it's beautiful writing. TLDR, Hilda has a mouth, Marianne has ears, it's a flawless symbiotic relationship. You said relationship. I did, Oh crap. <laughs> Ash Ubert, come on down for your cinnamon roll achievement. You earned it, my friend. Also, it's not Uber, it's Ubert with a T at the end. So I have no idea why I gravitated so hard towards Ash in my first playthrough. I just saw that there was a dude with freckles and gray hair and bright green eyes. And I was just like, that's 10 out of 10 character design right there. I then talked to him to find legitimately one of the nicest people in the game. And not annoyingly nice like Mercedes. Just a solid dude who would totally wait for you to tie your shoelaces. In fact, if you were to look up the definition of wholesome in the dictionary, you would find an entry saying, conducive of two are promoting moral well-being. And then you would find another entry saying Ash from Fire Emblem. I think one of my favorite parts to Ash, though, is that he's not stupid. He's not someone that believes in people for the sake of it. He gives people the benefit of the doubt, yeah, but he will absolutely fight for his convictions. And he also knows his way around a shady deal or two. Yeah, Ash actually grew up as an orphan, stealing whatever he could get his hands on for the survival of himself and his siblings. That was Ash's past, but it doesn't define who he is now. All that can be essentially boiled down to the generosity of Lord Lenato, who took Ash and his two siblings in and raised them as his own. It's a great story, honestly. A great story and a great character. And seriously, I can't get enough of these supports. There's so much great character work in them, it's unreal. My favorite being one where you have Ash pursue a romance with Petra. It's essentially a bunch of odd stories about how Ash is teaching Petra what he knows about being a citizen of Fodlin and a commoner. And Petra is like a princess from a foreign land, so she's super receptive to what he has to say. But then she tells him about her culture, since she's from a tropical archipelago, and how she loves to swim. Then Ash conveys that he's never been near a massive body of water like the Ocean of Bridget, and he would love the chance to swim someday. So in their ending, they went to Bridget, got married, and were noted for their shared love of swimming in the ocean. Oh, that's so sweet. Ugh. Their relationship has more chemistry than a periodic table. Don't hold this against me, okay? Oh dang, Claude didn't even make top three? That's gonna make a lot of people upset. But come on, being in the top five in a total of 24 students is pretty good. I'll explain my reasoning as I go forward. All right, so. Claude Von Regan is our resident meme master. Voiced by the charismatic powerhouse that is Joe Zizia, he's also probably one of the most unique lords in the series. Claude's not necessarily strong, but he makes up for it with his cunning and wit. Well, strong narratively, because Claude as a unit can still destroy any bandit with his hands tied behind his back. That is, as long as he can still wield Fail Not. For this reason, gotta love Claude. Fire Emblem definitely has a problem with a lot of the main characters feeling Samey. Marth, he's an honorable prince and wants you to treat him like a common man. Alm, he's an honorable warrior that turns out to be a prince and wants you to treat him like a common man. Krom, he's an honorable prince that wants you to treat him like a common man. Dimitri, you get what I'm saying. Claude doesn't carry himself like a noble, but that's mostly because he only became one a year before the story even starts. He lived his life as a commoner, not even knowing there was royal blood in him. Before then, all he experienced was everyone's favorite blight on humanity, racism. Yeah, he's essentially torn between his Fodlin heritage and his Elmiran ancestry, and people treated him differently because of it, sadly. So Claude wants to fight the CEO of racism and save Fodlin. Pretty good goals. Though there's one small problem to this whole plotline. You see, Claude really has no stakes in the overall story. Those memes you saw with the two people who are fighting and there's one in the back just watching, 
yeah, that's not really an exaggeration. This is very much Edelgard and Dimitri's story with Claude, and that's really unfair, I think. Especially since Claude is the only person in the game that learns about Sothis. That's pretty impressive, but he doesn't really do much other than that. You can remove him from the story and practically lose nothing. As sad as that is, it's also why I love Claude. You see, the influence of the Professor makes Dimitri and Edelgard into better people. Byleth being in their lives saves both of them from becoming worse versions of themselves. But Claude doesn't need the Professor. He doesn't need your help to be all he can be. Claude Von Regan is a righteous, good-natured, and determined miracle of a leader. And it's depressing watching him try to steer the sinking ship that is the Lester Alliance if you don't pick Golden Deer. But the thing to note here is that he steps up. Him losing doesn't really hurt his character. He did the best he could. Unless, of course, you kill him, you dirty Edelgard simps. The Verdant Winroud is often criticized for this reason. There seems to be the least reaction to the overall plot, if that makes sense. Like, when Edelgard is revealed to be the Flame Emperor, there's not even a cutscene! But why would there be? It means a lot if you know Dimitri and Edelgard, but Claude's just like, I guess that's happening. Ultimately, Claude is an amazing character, don't get me wrong, I just wish he had more stake in the plot. And more importance. Though I will say it's trash that only his route gets the best final boss nemesis. I wanna hear God Shattering Star, dang it! Smile for me. Whoa, I bet everyone forgot Cindered Shadows was even in the running, huh? I brought up Balthus briefly, but I feel like no one expected Yuri Leclerc to place over Claude. Alright, so. Why do I like this fanboy? Simply put, I feel like he commits to an archetype that Claude couldn't. See, Claude's whole thing is that he's constantly scheming, like he's gonna poison your drink or something. Yuri is exactly the same way, only difference is he's actually poisoning your drink. This is essentially what I would have loved Claude to be, an actual rogue. There's so many times that you don't even know if Yuri is actually on your side. You can't take your eyes off his lipstick for one second. As the leader of the Ashen Wolves, he's a descendant to a forgotten apostle, and thus bears a crest of his own. However, he does not come from from greatness. His backstory confirms this heavily. In fact, he's done some pretty despicable things. Way worse than Claude. This guy has actually killed people. And almost killed Bernadetta. You can't just threaten Bernie like that and expect to get away with it, you monster. Or I guess you can because you are number four on this list. To be fair though, Yuri regrets it. Deep down, he knows he has done wrong. There is a good side to him ultimately, even if he doesn't believe it himself at times. I also shamelessly shipped him and Bernadetta exclusively since the release of the DLC. What can I say? Opposition makes for poetic romance. I did well, right? So next time you can pair me with someone else. Yuri is the best. He's my favorite. <laughs> Honestly, I think I'm just a sucker for the true scoundrel archetype. Characters that seem like they don't care and they'll cheat and steal to get what they want. But at the end of the day, they have a heart of gold. For this reason, I would have loved to see Yuri given more spotlight. As it is now, he really is only relevant during the Cinder Shadows DLC. And he's great in it for sure, but it's not actually canon to the main game? In the main game's continuity, the Ashen Wolves went to live in Abyss voluntarily. Ugh. <laughs> Death, now this one I feel like most people could see coming to an extent. Bernadetta is consistently one of the, if not the, most beloved characters in the game, losing only to Jojo on occasion. Here's why Bernie is my number three. She had to face so many obstacles getting here, both narratively and with the other characters while I was writing this list. Without even knowing what makes her tick, Bernie slammed herself rather forcefully into our classes without us even realizing it. But there's gotta be more to it than just cute girl, right? There's plenty of cute girls. Why is Bernadetta Von Farley so special? Could it be the brilliant performance by Erica Mendez? <laughs> Could it be her amazing character design? Could it be the fact that you talk to her behind a door for 85% of the game? All these little things adding up to make an amazing character? Possibly. I just think Bernadetta is neat. Her supports, without fail, always get me emotional or laughing too hard to think. She's super memeable too. Bernie is just the whole package. And like I said with Marianne, Bernadetta is the other side to the social anxiety coin. You see, while Marianne is the more withdrawn side, Bernadetta is the more awkward side. She doesn't want to 
to talk to you. But instead of remaining quiet, she'll most likely scream or blurt out something completely insane or run away. Sometimes all three at once. But once again, you see where she's coming from. Surprisingly, Bernadetta has one of the more disturbing backstories among the students. Eh, skip to this timestamp if you just like to hear the positive aspects to our character. Okay, so her father, Count Varley, is a special kind of pure evil, and he tried his best to groom his daughter into being a perfect submissive wife. This led to years of abuse, even tying her to a chair for hours in order to teach her to remain silent. Yeah, that's that's really bad. And it is very easy to see how much it scarred her. Though don't fret, this backstory was patched out in an update. Guess we can't have anyone who went through similar trauma finding solace in a character like them. Nope. Can't have that. Anyway, Bernadetta's past is always there, but she fights it. It unfortunately shaped her into who she is, but now she has friends and a weird professor that wants nothing more than to just hang out with her. It's a happy ending for Bernadetta, and I'm glad because she's a delightful student. I can't even pin down a support of hers I'd consider a favorite. They're all amazing. Okay, wait, no, I lied. Hubert's is amazing because you're essentially pitting Bernadetta in social situations with Alucard from Helsing. Please watch where you're going in the future. How did you manage to faint while standing up? Lady Edelgard. Number two belongs solely to Edelgard von Hressvelg. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't even know where to start with her. Edelgard is probably the deepest character in Fire Emblem. Period. Three Houses revolves around her invasion of Fodlan and her efforts to destroy the Church of Saros. And the game's very theme song, Edge of Dawn, is strongly implied to be written by Edelgard herself. That's right, the game's overarching villain wrote the theme song. That's new, and it's probably because Edelgard isn't really a villain. At least she doesn't carry herself as such. I mean, geez, her interactions with her fellow students in the Black Eagle's house are very wholesome. My favorite, surprisingly, being Linhart's, where she essentially created a career specifically for Linhart, who spends his days reading and sleeping. This career has no deadlines, no expectations. She made it so that Linhart can research at his own pace and deliver his findings whenever he wants. Dang, bro, she hooked you up. When you first meet Edelgard, you see a determined young woman ready to inherit her father's throne. This girl gonna be emperor someday, and on top of that, she has a loyal second in command that will gladly do whatever dirty work that needs to be done. Edelgard is incredibly complex, taking multiple playthroughs of the other routes to even understand what makes her tick. After getting away from the whole empire situation going on, her youth was spent alongside Dimitri, the prince of the holy kingdom of Fargus. See, her mother actually married Dimitri's father, so in a way, they're like brother and sister, just not by blood. It was a very happy time in her life, until she was taken away to be tortured by those who slither in the dark. Time for one note villainy, ladies and gentlemen. They performed awful experiments on her, as well as her eight other siblings, all in an attempt to force her into bearing a crest. She served as the sole survivor, her hair bleached white, and now bearing both a crest of Saros and a crest of flames. Oh, also her lifespan dramatically decreased. At least we think so. Keep in mind, this trait is only shared with Lysithia. However, while Lysithia openly lamented laments her coming death, Edelgard doesn't. In fact, if you never interacted with Lysithia, you would never even know this was the case. Yet it's so important to understanding why she is the way she is. She openly engages the Church of Saros in Ward and the established system she deems evil. And yes, while you could make the argument that war is the only thing that will change the system instead of diplomacy, you can also see it as Edelgard doing what she can with the time that she has. Edelgard is always doing something to get closer to her goals. It's rather inspiring, actually. She doesn't linger on her past at all. She only looks to the future, which is her defining character trait. In fact, Dimitri gave a dagger to Edelgard in their youth as a gift, but Edelgard forgot where that dagger even came from. Heck, she won't even acknowledge Dimitri in her own route. He doesn't matter. All that matters is the future of Fodlin, and she doesn't care if she goes down in history as a murderous tyrant as long as the problem is eventually solved. Lover or hater? This is 10 out of 10 character motivation right here. A textbook example of great writing, except for... Must you continue to conquer? Continue to kill? Must you continue to reconquer? Continue to kill in retaliation? What the heck kind of logic is that?
should have known. But one day, you would be haunting me as well. Dimitri Alexander Blathed. I am Dimitri Trash. I'll admit it, I have no shame. Because seriously, how was I supposed to know that the most generic Fire Emblem Lord was literally going to become the best character in the game? Even though I'm sure many people will debate me on that, which is fine. It's fine to be wrong. When you meet Tree. When you. When you meet Tree. When you first meet Dimitri, you see a nice young man doing the best he can for the sake of his friends and allies. Though during the examination from Byleth, they note that Dimitri could be hiding an inner darkness. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure. I'm sure. And then this is confirmed by Felix that he is apparently a quote unquote beast. Okay, Felix, whatever you say, bro. Thing is, Dimitri has given you nothing to make you believe this is the case. He is unbearably sweet. And hello hilarious in his ignorance. By the way, sometimes you find edible plants among the weeds. Please do not eat the weeds. However, these tidbits start piling up, little by little. Like, it's kinda weird that Dimitri can't taste food. Also, why does Dimitri say it's alright to linger on the past as long as you need to? In a lot of ways, this makes him a polar opposite to Edelgard, because Edelgard knows who she is, and she lives her life without apology. But Dimitri lives his life like it's one big apology to everyone he lost during the tragedy of Dusker. I think the culmination of figuring out who Dimitri is, though, is when you have to save Remire Village. Essentially, there's a lot of innocent casualties, painting a familiar sight for Dimitri and the Blue Lions. The lines around Dimitri's eyes darken, and he seems a bit too angry at the situation. But you ignore it. That can't be who Dimitri is. The same boy who cursed you for forcing him to become a dancer can't be like this. Oh, was, was I the only one who did that? that uh huh uh, moving on. But it all comes to a boiling point. When you find out that the identity of the Flame Emperor, an enemy that has fought against you on multiple occasions, turns out to be Edelgard, that's when Dimitri absolutely loses it. The one person he could consider family, the one person that was left, now stood across him as his enemy. Keep in mind that Dimitri's entire family was gone due to the actions of those who slither in the dark. And now Edelgard stood there, the one who most likely orchestrated it. All this finally made sense in Dimitri's demented mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is some kind of twisted joke! And for the first time you've known him, he outright refuses your help. He does not want it anymore, and he will not be stopped. And Felix... Felix was right! The freakiest part is that you not only see the worst of Dimitri on full display, but you also see him at his happiest. The idea of killing Edelgard fills him with such joy that it's unsettling to watch. He even admits that his family has been telling him that they want Edelgard's head personally, but obviously they're dead. Dimitri is hearing voices in his head, you know. You just know that he's he's more far gone than you or the Blue Lion's house ever anticipated. Unfortunately, it just gets even more tragic from there. After the time skip, you find Dimitri again. This time he's taken up a hobby of decorating hallways with dead bodies. But it's okay though, because they're bad guys. And seeing him hunched over in that corner, it, it just feels like you failed him. He looks horrible. Though not literally, his design here is actually pretty cool. He's been through the ringer. They tried executing him. They killed the do. He's pretty much been driven completely insane from the voices. And now you're back. Which leads him to thinking that he's imagining you. It's, it's just beyond sad. And most of part two is spent with this unhinged Dimitri. He doesn't care about anyone anymore. Attempts to speak to him just end in him telling you to go away. You can't support him. You can't teach him. Him, really feels like the Dimitri you knew is dead. But then something miraculous happens. The war leads to the death of Rodrigue, another person close to Dimitri, and he laments that he now has to hear Rodrigue among the voices that torture him. However, Rodrigue tells him, None of them, none of us, died for you. I'm dying for what I believe in, just as they did. 
And this blew my mind. Like, that's such a classic trope, right? Person sacrifices themselves, and another person takes solace that their love was so strong, yada yada yada, but not here. Dimitri needed to hear that everyone he cared about did not sacrifice their lives for Dimitri. They lived and died for what they believed in. And as a result, this takes a massive load off Dimitri's shoulders. For the first time, he can live knowing that there isn't a legion of ghosts behind him. He can feel the warmth of your hands. He could begin the path to healing. And then he's back? That sweet Dimitri you knew is back again. Always there, but never seen. But here comes my favorite part. My absolute favorite part of all this. You see, Dimitri is nice again. But he isn't entirely freed from his demons. When you fight Cornelia, the one who took control of the kingdom from him, he expresses that same rage and bloodlust. Two reasons why this is amazing. One, Cornelia deserves it. Dimitri isn't just gonna go all mercy mode on everyone now just because he's nice again. Two, that's not how healing works. There isn't a spontaneous change of heart in most cases. It takes work and time to become a better version of yourself. Too many times in media, we see a person acting toxic, learn that being that way was bad, then immediately change for the better. Dimitri hasn't changed for the better. He is changing for the better. Much more realistic. I don't know, bro. I could talk about Dimitri all day, so I'll just wrap this up. I do especially love his ending where he has completely changed his stance on Edelgard because he actually thought it out rather than just blame whoever was the easiest to blame. Funny thing is, though, is that I don't even think Edelgard knew that the Fire Emblem Punisher was even out for her head. Or if she did, she didn't care. And then they have this moment after learning that the other isn't entirely wrong in their convictions. And then Dimitri extends a hand to spare Edelgard. L. However you interpret what Edelgard did next, It can't be denied, that hurt Dimitri far more than the dagger in his shoulder. He doesn't even think he's worthy of stepping into the light to see the people. But Byleth reassures him that he is worthy. Ah, I just, uh, I just gotta hand it to you, Blue Lions. Thanks for ruining every other route for me. Because I cannot play this game knowing Dimitri will die if I pick Claude or Edelgard. Though this is the part where I note the flaws with Dimitri's handling in the other routes. Thing is, they're entirely for different reasons, too. I'm not necessarily upset with him dying in both. It's obvious he would. I'm just upset with the how of it. Crimson Flower. Time skip Dimitri is healthy? Yuck! No! Get that stable Dimitri out of here! I remember seeing that design for the first time and immediately being confused by the lack of eye patch. But the thing is, is that to balance out part two of the game's various routes, the opposition will have more power so you can have more challenge. For example, in Dimitri's route, the Holy Kingdom of Fargus sucks. This gives you a goal in an uphill battle against the Empire. But in Edelgard's route, the Holy Kingdom of Fargus is putting up a pretty good fight. Cornelia didn't even assume control. I believe there was a way to make the rage-filled Dimitri work in this route instead of just omitting him entirely? Seriously, dude acts like a villain already. I really think fighting the eye patch beast Dimitri could have been super intimidating if they decided to utilize him during Crimson Flower. And then for Claude's route. <sighs> Okay, so, basically what happens is not too far off from Azure Moon. In fact, they're very similar. Dimitri returns with his eye patch, and he's a beast during the Grander Field reunion. And what happens to him? Oh, he died. Anyway. No, 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 no. Hold up. He just died? Like, like off screen. Hilda says Dimitri was surrounded by Empire soldiers and was killed. Sure, sure, yeah, no, that's, uh, I, get, I guess that's what we're doing. And let's not get it twisted. Again, I have no problem with Dimitri dying here. It was always a theme to Dimitri's character that his path will only lead to his eventual demise should he continue to walk it. Also, this is Claude's route, so Dimitri should be an afterthought. But he's one of the three main lords. You couldn't at least make it a cutscene? At least? It's embarrassing. It, it's like they didn't even know what to do with him here. Either way, that's that. My favorite character in the game. Thanks for listening 
listening to me ramble on about him. He's just super cool. Fire Emblem Three Houses is filled with plenty of delightful, hilarious, and amazing characters. And I didn't even include the staff. It's a well-written story and I recommend it to anyone. If you've played Three Houses before, let me know your favorite student of the bunch. Because even though my favorite is Dimitri, you can make a pretty feasible argument for any of the Three Houses characters. Except Cyril. Special thanks to my top tier patrons, Liddy Kitty, Trico Simp, and Teru XD.